I think it's important for activists to get out of their daily work and talk to other activists, especially for people who work in really difficult situations, which is true of a lot of people here. Just getting out of that stress and that daily sort of warping perspective makes you saner. I think it is also a very valuable opportunity to build these new connections with people who you wouldn't have met otherwise and to realize that both your delights and your struggles, they are shared by many others. I'd like to invite up a journalist and an activist who formerly resided in Russia. Hi, I'm the journalist, and this is the activist. There was quite a head-spinning time about a year ago when the eyes of the world were trained on Sochi during the Olympics. The activism that you'd been doing for a few years suddenly became the focus of everybody's attention around the world, or at least it felt like it. What was that like? That was indeed a mind-boggling experience to be engaged in pre-Olympics international outreach and advocacy campaigning. Of course, such huge international moments are full of enthusiasm, uh, they're full of energy, uh, they're beautiful because you feel uh, that you're connected, you're embedded in a larger community than your local community, you're part of the international force uh, that is driving a change. Uh, but what is truly interesting is the day after this beautiful, full of enthusiasm moment. One thing that happened the day after the Olympic Games is that the International Olympic Committee adopted a huge package of reforms just uh, on December 8th. Uh, the IOC voted on that package. And part of this package of reforms is uh, rewarding of um, uh, the Olympic uh, Principle 6, non-discrimination principle. So now it includes sexual orientation. This is a victory for everyone involved in this pre-Olympic campaigning. Another thing that happened the day after this beautiful moment is the thing that actually nothing happened in Russia. Nothing's changed for the community there except for this uh, acute, uh, tremendous visibility that we gained, uh, nothing else changed. And by nothing changed, what that means basically is that there is a concerted government-run anti-gay propaganda campaign that is resulting in ever-growing anti-LGBTQ violence that has cost people their lives, that has cost people their homes, that people are afraid is going to cost them their children. Uh, and for all of those reasons, people are either going underground or leaving the country. But we'll get to that. Um, and even before we get to the day after, I actually want to talk about the day off. You did something unusual during the Olympics. Right? You went out to protest in the streets, which is not the kind of activism you had done before. It was just a small um, guerrilla action where me and my friends were planning to put up a banner with a quote from the Olympic Charter, uh, Principle 6 of the Olympic Charter, one of the St. Petersburg bridges. But um, quite silly of us was the decision to decide and take a photo on our way to that bridge. And uh, right after we clicked on the button and took that picture, we were surrounded by five police cars, maybe even more. It was not just police, different law enforcement agencies like Center for Extremism Prevention, Prosecutor's Office, like I said, several police cars. And we were detained even before our action um, had uh, started. How long were you held for? Four and a half, five hours. But I think we managed to establish some kind of a human connection with them. So it was not as violent as, for example, the events in Moscow on the same day when a group of activists were detained at their attempt to um, sing the um, anthem the of Russian the Russian national anthem. Russian right? national People anthem. People were detained for singing the Russian national anthem. And some of them were physically abused while in detention, and some of them were only released um, the morning following their street action. So ours is a pretty humane experience. It's very interesting to watch Russia export this legislation because it becomes very clear how much the homosexual propaganda law, so-called, uh, is part of this larger crackdown on civil society. Because, for example, in Kyrgyzstan, the parliament is right now passing the, uh, the restrictions on NGOs that get foreign funding as a package with the homosexual propaganda law. And in Kyrgyzstan, when the law is passed, and I'm sure it will be, there will actually be a prison term for any neutral or positive portrayal of LGBTQ people that's not negative. The project you're working on now as a staff member at ILGA in Brussels, can you talk a little bit about that? Uh, yes, um, I recently joined ILGA Europe 
um, and they primarily work to support activists in countries with uh, very hostile environments, like Armenia, Azerbaijan, um, Georgia, also Russia, partly Ukraine, Belarus, and Moldova. We have developed and we will be launching um, uh, a new program in cooperation with COC Netherlands uh, to support the very grassroots uh, level of activism to create a, um, an enabling environment for building bridges uh, within local communities, building bridges with professional groups um, whose support is critical for LGBTI people, uh, building bridges with other civil society organizations. So we, we aim to create this enabling environment both through funding, through capacity building support, and through advocacy that we will do at the international level. You're uh, going to work at ILGA, obviously involved leaving St. Petersburg after this incredibly heady and difficult and uh, in some ways dangerous period of, of working uh, in this environment of increased visibility. What was that like and what was that decision like? It was an extremely painful decision because I had to leave St. Petersburg. If I had a choice to do the same work from there, I would have made that choice. Um, but I felt that I could contribute much more on a different level, on a structural level, uh, to support other activists. And you have a partner in St. Petersburg, right? Yes, I do. <laughs> so that must be difficult. But what's it like to watch what's going on in Russia when, when you're outside? It's a very crippling feeling, um, feeling of estrangement, uh, feeling that I'm not sharing these experiences anymore with the people I love and with activists, with people who inspired me and who've, who we have been through a lot of things together. But because, you're also safer in Brussels. Uh, well, yes, of course it is definitely safer and I feel much less paranoid than I felt when I was in St. Petersburg about I know, being followed and about my family having problems because of me doing activism. But I wouldn't say that it is emotionally more stable uh, because it's a very painful feeling of estrangement from something that you belong to, something that is the core of your identity. It's not a very happy note to finish on, but, uh, but I think it's actually appropriate. Thank you very much. Thank you very much.